I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 133rd episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your brain by any and all means at your disposal. We are finally getting around to a subject this week that I probably should have done much, much earlier because this is a well-known cognitive enhancing plant. Like most plants, it has been around forever. This is not something that was recently invented by Monsanto, but no, it's been used for thousands of years in Chinese traditional medicine, and they've got an American variety of the stuff too. We are talking about ginseng. And in the main interview, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Andrew Scholey all about ginseng and studies that he has both participated in and is aware of that have happened outside of his lab. So hang around for that. If you hang around for the very end of the episode, I'm going to tell you something about fish. I've been eating a lot of fish this week. I recently ended a seven-day water fast, so I've been getting back in the habit of having calories in my system, many of which have been fish-based calories, but I came across this article which made me feel a little bit guilty about the fish I've been eating. Why would I feel morally culpable to a fish? Well, I will explain in the Ruthless listener retention gimmick. But as usual, first let's kick things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. Okay, here's one that is a little bit surprising, but apparently there's something pretty good to be said about frequent use of the home computer where the brain is concerned. In elderly people who may be candidates for oncoming Alzheimer's disease, frequent use of the home computer is negatively correlated with actually getting Alzheimer's. In other words, a significant correlation was found between infrequent use and brain imaging symptoms commonly seen in early stage Alzheimer's patients. The volume of the hippocampus is a well-known biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. When this area starts to shrink, that is a bad sign. You don't want to see that. And this study conducted by OHSU, that's Oregon Health Sciences University, around where I come from, they have a Center for Aging and Alzheimer's Disease, and their study found that an additional hour of computer use daily was associated with a 0.025% larger hippocampal volume, which I guess means if you used your computer a whopping 20 hours a day, I don't think anybody does that, but if you did, on average, your hippocampus would be one half of a percent larger in size than a non-computer user. Pretty counterintuitive that such a small discrepancy might actually make a difference, but according to this study, it does. The researchers theorize that those with a smaller hippocampal volume may be less motivated to use their home computer because it requires the use of multiple cognitive domains, including attention, memory, and executive function. So while it may be a good idea to tell your nine-year-old to get off the computer and go out and play outside, active computer use by the kid's grandparent might be a good sign that's not worth complaining about. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews from the land of Oz. Clint Gregan from Australia says, If I'm researching a new stimulant or nootropic, Smart Drug Smarts is one of the first resources I turn to. Several of my friends now subscribe to the podcast as well, and it's been great fun comparing notes because, you know, we want to live a long time and to be smart forever. Not a bad couple of goals. And Owen Vibe, also from Australia, says, I first discovered this podcast a while back and have been tuned in ever since. Keep the content coming. I will spread the word here in Australia. Well, thank you guys and thank everyone internationally who's getting those iTunes reviews up there. That is a big help for the show. And really any of the social online media stuff is pretty fun. We've got a Twitter account, which is pretty active. We've got an Instagram account, if you're into that, the obligatory Facebook page, and of course, smartdrugsmarts.com. And actually a partridge in a pear tree too, while I'm listing things off, it would be very remiss of me not to mention axonlabs.io. That is our online retail site where we've got the stacks Nexus and Mitogen. I still am going cold turkey off Nexus and Mitogen. It's been almost two weeks weeks now. I did that water fast week, which ended about five days ago, but I'm still kind of just doing a big washout period, not really having any new tropics in my system, figuring it's good to reset the tolerances every now and then. And since I was having no food at all for a while, it seemed like no supplements, no new tropics made sense to tick all those boxes at once. I'll probably light things back up next week and get Nexus and Mitogen back in my system, but you are under no obligation to wait. So if you want to try either of those out or both of them, then head on over to axonlabs.io. I also want to put out a big thanks to our listener, Brian Allison, who sent me a smoothie recipe. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. This was something that he put forward as a way of potentially refeeding ourselves as people who were participating in the water fast came down off of it, started to get food back in our systems. If you go for a week without eating, the actual bag of your stomach reduces in size a lot. And there, there's a ton of changes that happen physiologically, but you want to be pretty gentle with your stomach in that first maybe 36 hours of refeeding yourself. And he put together a smoothie recipe that was both very tasty and highly nutritious. I actually had it 
going into the fast, not on the way out. But if you want to check it out, we'll have that linked on the post for this episode. That'll be at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 133. I'm also going to put it out in the coming newsletter. Smart Drug Smarts does have a newsletter. We publish approximately weekly. It's It's been probably about week and a half recently, but that'll be sometimes more, sometimes less. It has been a really busy last couple of weeks around here. That will probably continue to be the case throughout the summer. But every 10 days or so, if you want something in your inbox with a lot of neuroscience, you can hear what I'm reading about and riffing on and kind of see the menu of topics that we consider when we're putting together our episodes. Any or all of these would be great reasons to sign up for our Brain Breakfast newsletter, and you can do that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. I think that's all the housekeeping for this week, so let's move along now to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Professor Andrew Scholey from the Center for Human Psychopharmacology at Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia. I actually should be saying Melbourne, Australia and dropping the R because that's what a good Australian would do. I can't make myself do it, though. I just I sound silly when I try. But this is actually Dr. Scholey's second appearance on Smart Drug Smarts. We had him on quite a while ago talking about the plant Lemon Balm back in episode number 71. Lemon Balm is worth revisiting, by the way. If you missed that episode, it's a neat plant and is actually one of the rare things that we talk about on this show that tastes good as well as being good for you. But this time we're going to be talking about ginseng, which is another plant better known with cognitive enhancing properties. Like many, many plants, there are a lot of different strains of it, but the two primary divisions are between Asian and American ginseng. And then, of course, when it comes to getting pharmacologically active compounds out of plants, a lot of it depends also on the extraction and purification methods. So we'll be discussing all of that in the coming interview. As you'll hear Dr. Scholey mention, ginseng sounds like one of his personal favorites, and in addition to having significant effects, it can also have pretty strong effects. So not just statistically significant like they're likely to happen but it can actually pack a punch also, even relative to some pharmaceuticals. Apologies in advance that the audio quality of the recording of this conversation is not great. We were talking over a landline between two continents. Well, I mean, I guess at some point there was probably a satellite involved, but either way, just not the world's greatest connection on the phone that day. But hopefully that will not dissuade you because there's a lot of good information coming up. So let's jump in now with Dr. Andrew Scholey. This was one of the original herbs that was investigated for its cognition enhancing properties. I was quite interested because there's a link between blood glucose and cognitive function. Your listeners are probably aware that the brain is a a very greedy organ, so it's about 2% of a human body weight, but it's consuming about 20 to 30% of, of glucose and oxygen. And in fact, your capacity to regulate blood glucose is very tight be linked to cognitive performance. And there was some evidence showing that ginseng has glucoregulatory properties. So we sort of made the link that it possibly could have cognition enhancing properties. And this was also in keeping to some degree with its traditional use in traditional Chinese medicine, where ginseng is purported to have a kind of anti-fatigue pick-me-up sort of property. Now, just to clarify, when you say regulatory, is that to say that it's bringing levels up if they're too low or suppressing them if they're too high or a combination of both? Yeah, it's actually more related to the former. So it's the ability to drive the uptake of glucose. For example, in the standard glucose tolerance test, an individual is given a glucose load and then the levels are recorded in the blood. They go up quite dramatically and then they fall again due largely to the action of of insulin. And it turns out that the rate at which they fall back to baseline is a very good predictor of cognitive function. In fact, in a lot of disorders like diabetes, this is very tightly linked to glucose regulation, in fact, and and to the point that some individuals have described Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes because dysregulation of blood glucose, probably driven partly as well by insulin signaling, including in the brain, where we now know that insulin plays a very central role in, in some aspects of cognitive function. And so the original studies that we did, this this was back in I think the first publications in 2001, myself and uh, my then PhD student, David Kennedy, who were at a university in the north of England, did a series of studies into a number of herbal extracts with purported cognition enhancing properties, including ginseng. So in the original study, you know, we really were trying to capture these effects. So we did a trial where we used a battery of cognitive tests the CDR battery, we used a placebo and three doses of ginseng, a very highly standardized extract, which is very important in these sort of studies. 
And then we gave single doses to a cohort of, of young adults and then tested their cognition an hour, two and a half, four and six hours later. So we were taking snapshots of cognitive function following dosing. And of course, the, all of these trials that I, I'm describing were done using strict double-blind placebo control conditions. And we found quite, quite clearly a, an improvement in memory functioning over the course of the day. It's very striking, actually. So these were high-functioning young adults, college students, who, say, would come into the lab at, at 9 a.m. We tested their memory function during the day, and we found that their memory was still significantly better, say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And you know, we just hadn't really extended the testing because we thought any effect would have decayed. Actually, when you look at the pharmacokinetics of the individual components of ginseng, there's a good reason why the effects should be quite, you know, should endure over the, that sort of period. Question on the way that that memory study was done. Were they memorizing something early in the day and then just checking back on those memories or were they being asked to learn new material throughout the day? Yeah, good question. So the answer is the second. So at each time point, they underwent a battery of cognitive tests so the first thing that happens is they're presented with a, a list of words, a unique list in, at each occasion. And then they do the other cognitive tests. And about 20 or 30 minutes later, they're asked to recall the list of words. And there was also some pictures that they had to remember. But yeah, it was a, a different set at each time point. Great. And then the other thing that we found, which was surprising, but one of these things that you, you know sometimes makes the whole area of research worthwhile, was that there was a reduction in self-rated alertness. So the market for ginseng was billions of dollars worldwide. People were taking it as a kind of pick-me-up, and yet we found that it had a, a negative effect on alertness. Wow. Um, actually, uh, at a different dose to the dose that, that improved memory, but it just shows that these effects can be complex. Now, you mentioned self-rated alertness. Does that distinguish from actual alertness? Were people feeling less alert, or were they actually less alert? These We're talking about sort of mean effects here, so that's important. This was across the group, but the typical typical sort of measures that we use and it's used quite widely in psychopharmacology. They're called the bond Leder mood scales, which were first developed in the 70s and have been used in hundreds, probably thousands of drug trials. And the participant is presented with a set of lines. At the end of each line, there's an antonym, so we're describing an opposite mood state. So maybe alert and drowsy would be one. There are 16 of them, and they produce three mood scales items. So alertness, calmness, and contentment. And so it was the alertness factor which was reduced I should say by that was a one-off. So that was not something that we found in subsequent trials. The memory effect has held up in maybe half a dozen trials following the initial one, but the alertness just seemed to be a one-off. And again, it's one of the quirks of this sort of research is that it's really important to try and replicate the findings as often as possible because you do get these certain effects which can be a little bit fragile from single studies. What were the number of participants like in these studies? So these were typically about 20 to 30 in these early studies, but these were crossover trials. So each participant came back five times because they were trained on the tasks on one visit. Right. And then subsequent visits, they were tested under conditions of placebo and the various doses of ginseng. And of course, the order in which they received each dose was counterbalanced. So it wasn't that everyone got escalating doses or you know, they, that was completely counterbalanced, as were stimuli within each cognitive test. Could you talk a little bit about dosage sizes and tolerance and frequency of administration, things that people might want to know for their personal use? Well, I think probably there are individual differences in people's response. Typically, we tested 200, 400, and 600 milligrams. And interestingly, the 400 milligram dose was the most effective. And in subsequent studies, we found that the 200 or 400 milligrams more effective than higher doses. Yeah. You know, the reasons for that aren't at all clear. But of course, we're talking about substances with multiple active ingredients in them. So right. the pharmacokinetics are, are very complicated. But we do find that a lower dose is slightly better. It should make it very 
clear, we're not talking about, you know, these are pharmacologically characterized extracts. We're not talking about kind of homeopathic type of doses. Sure. And as far as that goes, are there different extraction methods or distillation methods that people are going to find used when they're looking for retail ginseng? If somebody's sort of shopping around and trying to find something for their own medicine cabinet, what should they be looking for? I think there are differences in the extracts. And in fact, a number of studies have found that some so-called ginseng products on the shelf contain little or no actual ginseng, which is a, a really big problem in this area. Yeah. I'm sure you're aware the regulatory framework in North America and Europe and here in Australia, um, it differs and there are different requirements in terms of standardization. So, you know, the sort of interest of transparency, I think I should you know, make it clear that a lot of this research has been sponsored by industry partners. I mean, they give us a grant, they don't get involved in design. Yeah. So we use an extract called G115, which is an extract from a company who are called Ginsana now, a Swiss company. And that I know is very high quality because I've seen a number of documents based showing the quality control that they require. The other ginseng that I've studied is an American ginseng. So that's an Asian ginseng, so-called Panax ginseng, G115. And then there's an American ginseng, which is Panax quinquifolius. Now, as I say, these are just the extracts that I've worked with. There may be other extracts out there that are equally as good, but my own feeling is that it's better to use the extracts that have actually been tested in clinical trials. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is that you're also then supporting the companies who actually sponsor research, which is a good thing. Yeah, that, that's a great point to make and probably one that we don't make enough. So for the two main varieties, the American and the Asian ginseng, that's actually a difference in the type of plant. It's not just an extraction method. Can you give us sort of a compare contrast breakdown on the differences of those two plant strains? Yeah, sure. So most of the work is focused on Asian ginseng. There's a, a huge market for it, you know, partly in, from its use in traditional Chinese medicine. It's also a big industry. So there's actually, a, in 2012, a 325-year-old wild ginseng plant was sold for 1.57 million US dollars. Wow. <laughs> because it's purported to have some sort of special properties. I don't know about that. So the active ingredients in ginseng are the ginsenicides. So this is a group of about, well, there are 11 major ginsenicides, and they've got fairly uninspiring names like RB1, RB2, RG1. And there's been quite a lot of research looking at the properties of the individual ginsenicides. There was a review by Imogen Smith a couple of years ago as the lead author, a very comprehensive review looking at the properties of these individual ginsenicides on neural processes. And there are hundreds of publications, a lot of them on animal models, showing that they have central activation, so they affect the central nervous system. And the difference between American and Asian ginseng is complements of ginsenicides. So in particular, American ginseng has a higher level of the ginsenicide called RB1, maybe double the amount of Asian ginseng. And Asian ginseng has a higher level of RB2 and RC. So I'm not an organic chemist, so I can't tell you anything about what the structure of, of these or the structure function relationships. But certainly RB1, which is enriched in American ginseng, has had a lot of research in the context of its central properties. And as far as the actual end results that people are going to feel when they take it, why might somebody choose one over the other? Overall, the effects of Asian ginseng or Panax ginseng is mainly on memory processes and there are also some effects on mood. Whereas with American ginseng, the effects appear to be on working memory. So this is the ability to hold information online. Having said that, the effects of American ginseng or the studies of American ginseng have really been restricted to two studies, both actually from my lab. So more work needs to be done there. I think, and ideally somebody else will take that up and explore that further. So for the Asian ginseng, the strongest effects then were on long-term memory versus sensory or short-term memory. Yeah, so recalling information. We also found that Asian ginseng has an effect on mental fatigue. So it, it seems to be particularly beneficial in under conditions where an individual is hammering their cognitive resources. So we have used an instrument that we call the cognitive demand battery. So what happens is that you will sit in front of a computer and you 
have to do a set of very intense mental operations involving mental arithmetic and vigilance over the course of about an hour. And what we find under those conditions is that ginseng improves performance and also reduces ratings of mental fatigue. And that's really quite consistent with the idea that ginseng may be helping to regulate blood glucose, at least with, with Asian ginseng. And in fact, what we think may happen is that somehow the ginseng is involved in sensitizing cells so that it kind of drives an increase in levels of glucose. And, and this was a study that was carried out by another PhD of mine, um, Jonathan Ray, who found that what was quite paradoxical is that under these conditions of cognitive demand, performance was better, fatigue was lowered, and yet blood glucose went down. And we think it was because the glucose was being, as I say, taken up by active cells involved in cognitive performance. That, that's fascinating. So it sounds like it's, it's getting more efficiently used. Exactly. Although I think it's also worth mentioning that there are multiple mechanisms. And one of the reasons that myself and, and other people are looking at herbal extracts in this context is because the attempts to improve cognition using interventions which only affect single mechanisms have been really spectacularly unsuccessful over the years. It really doesn't fit with what we know about brain function, the idea that you can just go in and really hammer single systems in the brain. For example, you know, the cholinesterase inhibitors, which are used to treat Alzheimer's disease, haven't really been what you would call a success story. And probably it's because it really doesn't square with what we know about brain function, which is that it's extremely complicated. The more we learn about brain function, the more complex it becomes and, and we're really just scratching the surface. But I think it's unlikely that there's going to be a solution like a kind of double helix of brain function. I think <laughs> the beauty of the brain lies in its complexity. And so, you know, it does seem that there are certain plant extracts which have evolved to have a kind of complement of properties which nudge many systems in a positive direction. And regarding ginseng, we know that some recent studies just from this year have shown that it upregulates the cholinergic system, so the system which is really demolished in Alzheimer's disease, but also has effects on glucoregulation, as I said. And again, another study from this year showed that it had some cardiovascular benefits because the brain is so richly vascularized, it has a very rich blood supply that systemic improvements in cardiovascular function can also improve brain function. You said something really interesting there, which was, I guess, implying that there might have been some coevolution of the plant with humans. Is there any evidence to that? The way that some of our food crops have definitely been strongly impacted by generations of human domestication of the plant. Do we see that with ginseng? or is it essentially a wild plant? Yeah, originally a wild plant that was being harvested. I don't know if days were exist on the complements of ginsenicides in the ancient plant. So... Yeah, I don't know, but it's a very interesting idea. And of course, the idea that there's some questions to why these plant extracts have evolved these components is a very interesting one. And it may be that to do with commonalities in the human nervous system with other living organisms, for example, even with insects, when we know that some of these components have evolved to attract insects or to, to protect against insects. So it's possible that some of the roots of these effects lie in, in that aspect of plant evolution. Yeah, I know that nicotine is one of the most effective insecticides out there, which is interesting because it can be a strong cognitive booster for humans. Exactly, and that's a really excellent example. Do people build up a tolerance to ginseng if they've been using it for a while? Is there a point where it sort of has a drop off in its positive effects? We haven't really looked at that. The only study that looked at that that I've been involved with was a 12-week study where we did find the improvements were restricted to acute doses. In other words, it does seem to rely on having an effect in the immediate kind of aftermath of a single dose. Gotcha. So n no long-term benefits? Not that we've seen. I know there are some, some ongoing trials in conditions like Alzheimer's, which will be examining those. And certainly in animal models, there's good evidence that ginseng should benefit conditions like Alzheimer's. But the translation of animal models into human clinical trials in this field has really been riddled with failure. So it's very important to, for us to see the results of the RCTs. 
And I guess that probably also answers my next question, which is, is there ever a loading period where you might take more at the beginning? But if it seems to be most effective only in acute doses, I'm assuming that the loading period doesn't really factor in. Yeah. And again, this is sort of people who are effectively self-medicating or experimenting themselves with products like ginseng. And I think it's very important that people are aware of the safety profile and look into that. But also, if you're taking any other medications, for example, always recommend that people discuss it with a physician first. Based on your experience, are there contraindications or types of people that ginseng might be a bad idea for? There have been cases of ginseng toxicity, but it's very rare. And the cases that I'm aware of have been individuals who actually maybe have got some sort of obsessive compulsive disorder, which gets focused on ginseng. So they're taking huge amounts, tens, hundreds of times the amounts that we use in our trials. Oh, wow. Yeah. With its effects on things like glucose regulation, anyone who has any kind of diabetic sort of indications should really discuss it with their GP first. I know that the brand names for different products are going to going to vary across the different parts of the world. So what you have in Australia versus us in the US versus Europe are probably going to be different. But are there any particular recommendations on trusted brands you want to put out there? Yeah, I mean, I think the ones that I mentioned before, and, and really, again, just make it absolutely clear, these, these are the ones that I've worked with. And these were sponsored by the industry partners, but I know that they are high quality. So G1 one five, which is marketed as Ginsana, and Cereboost, which is manufactured by a very reputable company called Naturex, and I think it's marketed as Cereboost in the US. So the two extracts that I work with, and I know that they're high quality. I think there are a couple of things. So again, one of the early studies that we did looked at evoked potentials when people were on ginseng versus placebo. Actually, we did a comparison with ginkgo, and we found that on ginseng, people had a reduced latency of the P300 waveform, which sounds complex, but this is an index of working memory. What we found was that reduced latency effectively means that people were, their working memory was, would be more efficient when yeah. on ginseng. But more than that, it actually just showed that it was doing something centrally. It was doing something in the brain, which I think was I think is important to show that there is central activation. So there is a couple of other things that I might want to mention. So the first is a study that my PhD student, Chris Neal, was responsible for, where we looked at the effect sizes of all of the studies which had looked at ginseng and compared them with effect sizes for a pharmaceutical cognitive enhancer, so modafinil. So we found that for modafinil, the largest effect size we could find, this is using a formula which calculates something called Cohen's D, which is just a kind of universal measure of how big an effect is. We found that for modafinil, the largest effect size was 0.77, whereas for ginseng, it was 0.86. So it's certainly wow. comparable with pharmaceutical effect sizes. And in fact, for mood, this mental fatigue effect that I mentioned earlier, the effect size was nearly double what the effect size was for modafinil. It was uh, 1.4. So these are substantial effects. But I should also just say that in some of our studies, there can be a cost. So sometimes when we find benefits of substances like ginseng, say, you know, speed of reaction time, there's a loss on other elements of cognitive function, like, you know, like an increased error rate, for example. They tend to be at different doses, so that's important. But it's worth bearing in mind, I think, that if people are going to take these, they might want to think about what could be the most effective dose for them. Yeah, I think like you mentioned earlier, with the brain being so complex, it's it's difficult to imagine one substance that's going to improve everything across the board. It seems a lot more realistic to try to find something that's going to help one or a few aspects and just be aware of the trade-offs. That's very true. I should also just mention that a few years ago, there was a Cochrane review. So this is a very sort of high-level review used very widely in the medical profession to, to really decide whether something is effective or not. They set the bar very high and that review did conclude that, and I'm quoting here, ginseng appeared to have some beneficial effects on cognition, behavior, and quality of life. So I think of many of the herbal extracts that I've studied in this context, it's one of the most effective as a cognitive enhancer. 
any recommendations as far as time of day that people might want to take or avoid it? It sounded like this is something that gets cleaned out of your system relatively quickly. Is it something that might disrupt sleep if somebody took it too late in the day? That's possible. And certainly in all of our trials, people have taken it in the morning. And as I say, we still recording benefits six hours later. So yeah. I guess morning might be more effective. Do we know the exact half-life? Is that something that's been teased out? It is known, but the half-life varies because of there are so many different components. Right. But yeah, so the half-life of some of the ginsenicides is up to, I think, six hours. That's from memory, so that may not be accurate, but of course, that's just the half-life. So, you know, you still get half the levels in your system after six hours. I don't think we've actually used the term adaptogen yet in this interview, but ginseng would be considered an adaptogen, right? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly in traditional Chinese medicine, it's seen as an adaptogen, but it has sort of buffering against stress. Yeah. You know, from our work, putting people under high levels of mental fatigue and showing that ginseng can protect against the negative mood effects and enhance cognitive function in those conditions would support that. So, so now the fun question, if you were able to do any study you wanted on ginseng to take another run at it with you know, a budget of no object, what would you still want to find out? Some of our early studies were looking at EEG, as I mentioned. At the moment, a lot of the studies that we're doing here at the Centre for Human Psychopharmacology are looking at brain imaging. So we have fMRI and another methodology called MEG, magnetoencephalography, which looks at changes in the magnetic field of the brain. And yeah, I would love to be able to do a study looking at ginseng's effects on brain activation. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. Sholi for taking the time for that interview. I got to admit, ginseng has a little special place in my heart because it was the first thing that I ever heard of, although I didn't put it in this context at the time, but that I heard of that was a cognitive enhancer. I remember I was probably a junior in high school when a friend of mine said, hey, I've got this stuff called ginseng. I, I take it. It's in this pill. You know, he showed it to us and he was kind of furtive about it, like maybe it was something he shouldn't have in school, but he said it you know, gave him more energy and blah, blah, blah. And all of us huddled around and were excited and ooh, ah, what is this? stuff. But as I remember, he did not share. I don't I don't think I actually got to try any at the time. But nevertheless, that was my first pubescent dawning awareness of the world that would one day become smart drugs. But I got to admit, prior to this conversation, I'd always sort of had the misimpression that ginseng was more of a physiological booster and didn't necessarily have a whole lot of effect on cognition. Now that I've had that mistaken impression dispelled, I will definitely be getting my hands on some and giving it a try here. So stay tuned on that. I'll let you know what I think or tweet at me or something if it takes me too long to get to commenting about it on the show. But now I promised I would tell you why I'm feeling guilty about eating so much fish this week. So let's jump ahead to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So with Water Fast Week over, I've been back to eating again this week, which has been a nice change. But since I was deep in ketosis anyway, since my body was already burning fat, I decided I would stay on a very high fat diet this week and probably for the next couple of months. And so I've been eating a lot of fish. There's a lot of, you know, good, healthy, natural animal fats in fish, as we've talked about before in previous episodes. And although I certainly understand and I wish that it was not necessary to kill a bunch of animals to eat meat, until we have a nutritionally comparable solution with less ethical difficulties to it, I will probably continue to be eating animals. But I definitely feel like intuitively there's a big major gradation between the level of awareness and therefore the level of you know potential suffering that an animal could have. I'd much rather eat a roundworm than a monkey because I think a monkey is a lot more aware of its existence. And I've always thought that fish were probably pretty low on the hierarchy of animal self-awareness. So I've always sort of given myself an, an ethical free pass when eating fish, just kind of like, ah, come on, you know, fish doesn't really know. But I had that rug somewhat pulled out from under me today when I came across a recent study from the University of Oxford that shows unequivocally that at least one species of fish can recognize different human faces and not not just like kind of sort of, you know, squint and recognize them, but really accurately differentiate one human face from another. And this is weird. This is surprising. You wouldn't think this would be the case. We've talked a lot on previous episodes about specific areas within the human brain. The main area is something called the fusiform gyrus, which is kind of like a, a special hardware subcomponent off your brain's motherboard, which is specifically for human facial recognition. It's what allows you to see all the fine gradations in somebody's mood. It's what allows you to not see somebody for 20 years as they age and look overtly different or gain a lot of weight or lose a lot of weight and you still know it's the same person. So we've got this special dedicated hardware for facial recognition. And we also have a brain that is just by and large massive compared to anything else in the animal kingdom. So you wouldn't really think that a little fish that does not, needless to say, share an environment with humans, so it has no reason to have evolved any special hardware for recognizing human faces, would necessarily be able to do this. If you, if you think about it, I mean, from a fish's perspective, humans have got to be pretty standard looking. We've all got these inset areas for our eyes. We've all got, you know, foreheads and noses and these gross features 
features that are they're probably pretty strikingly similar if you're coming from a totally different species. And yet this little tiny fish called an archer fish, it's called that because it can spit a stream of water to knock insects out of the air. So it's kind of got like a little built-in squirt gun. Scientists trained archer fish to get a food reward if they sprayed their water at a particular human face. This was not a real person's face, but a, an image of a human face on a computer screen. They got trained that they spray this face, they'll get some food pellets. And then they would show an array of different faces with the one face that they'd been primed to recognize somewhere in the middle of them. And the fish were strikingly accurate at recognizing the face that they'd been trained on. So they'd show them an array of up to 44 new faces with sort of the Where's Waldo face hidden among the crowd. And the archer fish would be able to identify and spit their water stream at that one particular face. The first time they were tested at doing this, they had an average peak performance of 81%. And the next time they were up to 86%. So this is not a statistical fluke. These fish were definitely pegging their man. And they were able to do this even when it was just facial features that were distinguishing when they made all the outlines of the heads and the haircuts and things like that on these images strictly identical. So the next time, should you ever hear anyone say that old racist standby, all so-and-sos look alike, describing you know, some nationality or ethnic group or whatever, feel free to absolutely lay into them. Because if a little tiny archer fish from a completely different species can distinguish between different human faces, there's absolutely no excuse for any sighted person within our species to not be able to do the same. Just say no to dr- Ah, scratch that. Say yes to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode number 133. You have made it to the end. Thank you for hanging around the whole time. And if you're still here, now we have the valuable cash prizes. Not really. But I will tell you what we're going to have next week, which is our first particularly dog-themed episode. It's not an episode about how to make your dog smarter. And in fact, it's actually about a compound called rapamycin. But some very interesting canine studies going on around rapamycin. And we might be able to draw some human conclusions, or at least not conclusions, but human inferences based on those studies. Next week's episode will be the closest episode that we have to 2016 Take Your Dog to Work Day. So knowing my zeal to try to tie any topic I can in with a holiday, whether obscure or not, I figured that next week would be perfect for our Rapamycin episode. So please come back for that. If you missed last week's episode, that was looking at obesity and its effects on memory and cognition. Talking with Dr. Lucy Cheek, and that was episode number 132. The links to everything that we talked about today, by the way, are up online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 133, including that super tasty, water fast week refeeding smoothie recipe. So that is all. I'm out for now. Catch you next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.